presentation title today is Revitalizing Library Collection, Casio Library Experience. Um, we okay, glad. So first I would like to know how we get into this situation we have to do this project. In 2015, the Kansas State University and Southern Polytech University consolidated. And the consolidation was the two libraries into one library system, and then we end up with three library locations, one library on each campus, and the other one is an off-site repository facility. And the combined the collection is about 400,000 monographs. So, as a result of this consolidation, we face big challenges. And the top one we have to deal with right away is the collection age. Very unfortunately, neither library had done any collection management project for last decades. So the collections really age. And also the collection relocation. Um, after consolidation, the campus of state, the main campus starts to be more liberal arts concentrated, and the other one is more STEM concentrated. So in order to facilitate the collection usage and meet the user needs, we got to shift some books around. So in 2017, my supervisor, I was the as my title says, I'm the monograph coordinator. So my boss and I start to talk about what we need to do with this collection. So after many discussions, we realized we had to do a major collection management project to uh, identify the books need to go and also identify the books need to be <coughs> relocated. Um, so in the past two years, from managing this project, we gained some first-hand experiences, and I would like to share some of them with you and see whether you can take some home for your library if you are planning to do the same project. <coughs> so our first recommendation is try to plan as comprehensive as you can, you can do it. So after we made the decision to uh, do this project, we started to sit down and plan, as this one says, uh, Benjamin, Benjamin Franklin said, by failing to prepare, you are prepared for fail. So that's so true. So once we made the decision, we sat down, we did a lot of research on what had been done from the other institutions, libraries, and also we think about our <coughs> unique situation, the collection-wise, the resources-wise, and also we consulted with all the departments which will be involved in the project, how we can collaborate, how we can make this thing work. This is a huge. We have never done it before. So these are the plans we developed. The first we did a strategic, five year strategic plan to include this waiting project as a more a major goal, one of the major goals for our strategic plan. And then we made a plan for this specific project for the next five years. And then we developed annual plan with more detailed information when the project is rolling on. And then we made a master schedule, which means a project this size, we have to keep ourselves in check what we need to do at certain time of the year. So this is the master plan. Um, we, I wish I could show you a link before the project because the, uh, before the presentation, but I just simply don't have time to show you each one. But I brought the samples, what we had, if you are interested, and then you can just after presentation, you can take a look, and if you like what we have done, I can email you um, later. 
So with this plan, once we divide, we send them to the administration, send to the departments to be involved, and they all, we got all agreed upon this one. So before the project, we know everybody is on board, everybody is supportive. So we're very confident and we can move forward. <coughs> so after we make the plan, the next is how to do it. We know we're going to do it. This is our plan to do it, but how to do it. And this is important, another important aspect for us to how to create a workbook. Simplex workflow. So um, we had a lot of discussions with this one. For the last two years, we made some modifications uh, along with the project. And this is our currently used workflow for uh, this project. Basically, we have six phases. Uh, the first phase, uh, we start with a proposal. And the project coordinator, that's me, I develop the project proposal with all the details about this specific plan, um, with the objectives, the targeted collection, uh, the goals, the key members, the, di the uh, timelines. So this is a, I think I can get to, oh, this one is not moving. <laughs> Let me see whether you were like me. Okay. So I think this one let's see whether you won't let me open yeah, for some reason. Sure. Yeah. So <laughs> but it's in the in my uh, folder so you can take a look. So basically that's the guideline for this particular project. And then after the proposal is done, approved, and the supervisor and administration will move forward to the next phase, then the collection. We didn't, we didn't use any collection evaluation tool for this project because we realized the complexity and the, um, the collection condition we want to do. We are determined to a very thorough and um, review and evaluate each title by subject librarians. <coughs> so that's what we determined to do. So once I got the systems librarian will be on the, our team to run this report. And then once the report is run, I will compile a re data review spreadsheet. Very unfortunately, I cannot Okay. Is it showing? It's not no. showing. It's very strange. I've never seen it. <laughs> very, very strange. Okay. So the data review sheet, it's just a spreadsheet. The first part will be <coughs> the book information uh, we got from Alma. And then the usage information, <coughs> the user usage information, we use that one as a, a part of the criteria. And then the review information, which the reviewers will fit in. And the process is, once I got the spreadsheet ready, I said to the review team, the review team had three people always, project um, me, undergraduate subject liaison. We have an undergraduate subject liaison for each subject, and graduate library. We have a graduate library. So we have graduate library for each subject. So three of, of us form a review team. And in the spreadsheets, or say I will do the first round, totally based on the weighting criteria. And I will talk about this one first. The weighting criteria is very, very important. Because um, at the beginning, the very early stage, we didn't use like very detailed 
criteria, it creates some questions, inconsistencies, a lot of confusions. So later we realize this is really important. So before we start to review any collection, three of us sit down to talk about this specific collection and what the video criteria will come up with. For example, for uh, engineer, anybody's engineer? For engineering collection, you got all these standards, codes, different kind of conference proceedings, some were very old. So uh, how to deal with those? If you don't have a detailed waiting criteria, it's really hard. And we come up with different kinds of decisions. But since we look at this collection, and then we know this will come up, we before it comes becomes a problem, we already had the standard set up, the criteria. So when we got to this specific book, I said, okay, the way the criteria says this way, we're going to make a decision this way or that way. So um, that's my suggestion. Before any, you wait for a specific subject, create, develop very detailed, uh, Waiting criteria that helps you a lot. So, when you, during the process, everybody uses the same standard to evaluate every type of, so it reduces a lot of confusions, questions, and increase the consistency in the decision making. So, I will do the first round, and then the undergraduate librarian will come after me to check out my decision, either withdraw <coughs> or delete or re re relocate, the other one will check on me. And the final decision will be made by graduate library. She will come and check our decisions, especially when we have disagreement, and she's the expert. He or she will be an expert in the area, so we take that person's final decision. Um, so this, I wish I could show you that one, but anyway. So this is the third phase. So when this phase is complete, I compile a whole withdrawal list for all the books we identified to withdraw. That I compile a list and send it to the stacks maintenance team. This is from our access services, and it's under stacks coordinator. So when he received my list, he will assign his team to each facility to withdraw the books. And when the withdraw, when the books uh, are all pulled and the final list available, then he will go into send to the uh, catalog maintenance team. The catalog maintenance team is more like a resources library, so he, he or she will purge the whole uh, withdrawn records from the catalog. So once this step finished, then it's my turn again. I will start to do a project summary report to finish up the project <coughs> summary report, which I cannot open. <laughs> the summary report will show what we have achieved, what the key success <coughs> for the project what's the uh, issues we conquered, and how we dealt with, and what's the lesson we learned. We just gave a whole summary, and then use this one to improve for the next project, always. So this is basically what we come up with um, this process. It had been working for us really well. Yeah, so it has been working with us really well. In between, I, I couldn't go to details, like in between here, we did some twisting, like the, instead of sending the whole list, we chuck out the collections. Mm -hmm. We set like one third of these to do to them first, so they can go ahead, move the books, pull the books, and then we are working on the second chunk part, and then the second part we move on. So in this way, the uh, phase four and five can do simultaneously. 
So it is increased, gave them more time to pull books and gave us more time to review books. So, um, so that's what we come up with. This uh, workflow, I think it is, uh, has been uh, agreed upon and has been um, accepted by all these departments. <coughs> So everybody is happy, even though the task is massive, but everybody seems to be happy. <coughs> so what is the average time for one of your projects in terms of with the number of people involved and the time that it takes for the decision if you're doing a one by one on one? We do by semester. Oh, by okay. semester. Yeah. So once we, what we divide, you can take a look at our plan. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what we decided, this is a five-year plan. We do one project per semester for the target collection. When we choose the collection, when we uh, divide the collection, we uh, give priority to those type sensitive one first, like the technology, computer science, engineer. Those we go first, and then social sciences and the humanities. And then uh, also the collection size, we need to, because we need to chop up five years, we have 15 projects, we chop up those uh, collection to 15 parts and do one per semester. One project per semester. Yes. Did you account for government documents? I'm sorry. I know, it's just where we are running no, out of time. We, okay, uh, I'll wait till the end. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay, yeah, we're through. <laughs> what's, what's <coughs> we are at 3.48. <laughs> Let me see my timer. Okay, I'm almost there. <laughs> Last one. Ooh. Can you see it?
are you need to take a look at our science library. Here's just some basic background information about it. It's very weird to not have it on that screw the screen and have to look up there to see what you guys are seeing. Um, uh, we, that's the size of the building and kind of the collections that are in there. And currently, uh, we, are, we do have two tenants, our campus IT and the campus writing center are in that building as well. So what happened is in January of 2018, the dean of the undergraduate education division came to our university librarian and said, I have a plan. I want all of my programs to be located in one place, and I think the library would be a lovely place to do that in. And that would include um, placements, testing, student skills workshops, campus honors programs, scholarship opportunities. Basically, he called it the Student Excellence Center. Uh, and our university librarian said, okay, let's, let's actually consider doing this. That means it would, giving up our fifth floor. First of all, our library is shaped very oddly. I don't know if you can see that. Um, but it would be giving up this floor uh, to them for this plan, which about, we'd have to, we could shift some of the stuff downward, but it would mean getting rid of between 130,000 to 160,000 volumes. I'm sorry, I should say getting rid of. That's how we vote it means sending to an off-site storage <laughs> or potentially deselecting some of that material. So why would we agree to do this? Uh, you know, it's a library space. We'd already given up room for our IT department. Um, you know, obviously it creates goodwill with uh, stakeholders on campus, which is nice. Um, means there's an opportunity for closer collaboration with some of those programs that the campus might honors. Uh, and of course there'd be more foot traffic in our science library for people going to, um, to the Student Excellence Center. But the big reason, I will admit, is uh, we wanted financial support and we thought we could get it this way. Here are some fun Yelp reviews we have of our science library. Um, the image I'm showing is what we call the grand reading room and it is the circular part uh, and it is just a gigantic <coughs> area and it's noisy um, and not very welcoming, I guess you could say. So we knew we couldn't afford really to do a lot of changes, but the dean of the uh, Division of Undergraduate Education was like, well, we're going to build that in because we, we want to help. You know, if you guys are giving us space, we should get, you should get stuff out of it. So here's a list of the things that um, we are getting. <coughs> it is the plan. And um, it's not a huge renovation of the building, but it's, it's just different, smaller things that I think will make a, a big difference in our, our library setting. So uh, that was what was happening. But because of this, um, because we were working on this project and we knew we were going to need campus support, our library administration said, hey, let's also, why don't we take a look at our main library that's never had a holistic weave. We're going to do this now. We've got campus support. We're going to have the infrastructure in place. And then campus is paying for things like green glass and everything. Let's do the, the main library as well. So that was, um, that was interesting. That sort of happened a little bit later on. Um, we had to do some convincing of some of the humanities and social sciences librarians who always thought, hey, this is a science thing. library. I'm not going to worry about this. Uh, and of course, you know, moving stuff out of our main library isn't going to create space in our science library, but we just decided it was the most fair thing to do and to, to work on this at the same time. Okay, so we've got our planned timeline here of what was happening. Um, I'm talking about today pretty much this, the, this box here, but what we're working on right now is that second box is actually pulling the materials that's coming. The provost um, said, okay, you know, you're, that, your initial proposal sounds very interesting, but let's form a, form a committee on campus, give me all the details, how is this going to work. So there's an ad hoc committee on the Student Excellence Center, and this was an incredibly important committee. Um, it really helped us get the campus support we needed. The, it was comprised of our university librarian and two of our AULs, but that was it from the library. Um, the rest of the representation came from across campus. There was faculty from logic and philosophy of science, um, comparative literature, the vice provost for teaching and learning, an associate dean for biological sciences, and importantly, uh, it had representations from the graduate students and the undergraduate students as well. So that group then charged a library committee, which I was on, to conduct a holistic review of the collections across the library buildings to identify low use and duplicate items that can be moved off site without negatively impacting research, teaching, and learning. And we had about um, seven, six or seven months to do that. 
So, basically, in the back of our minds, is we really wanted to avoid faculty and students getting upset and protesting. I don't know if anyone was just at the Battlegrounds presentation. Okay, that was uh, one that I just came to. But you can see, it, this, is, this is our nightmare scenario. What's happened at USC, what happened at UT Austin, UVA, and Yale. <laughs> so we're like, okay, let's make sure we get we engage our stakeholders early, and they're on board, and that they understand this progress process. So we did use green glass for us, uh, for our project, and I'm um, sure you guys or know about it. I did print out some of my green glass things because there's 59 columns, so there's no way I was going to be able to get it on a slide. But if anyone wants to look at it afterwards, I'm happy to show it to you. But really, you know, it's a query builder for developing withdrawal scenarios. It's really great for managing data at our level. Ming's project was, this was very different about what they were looking at. Um, but it was great. It gave us these extremely easy to use read reports about our collection, the usage, comparison to other libraries. Um, and we got that report in June of 2018, which then led us to figure out what is going to be our criteria for what we get rid of. Uh, and you can see what we decided is over on the left side box. Um, my AUL for Research Resources decided early on that he just thought there was a psychological argument about weeding versus sending things off-site. So we were not weeding. We are sending material to our off-site storage, which is located actually an hour away. It's not super close. It's up, in, um, up at the UCLA campus. Um, so it took us a little while to just massage the green glass data to figure out criteria that would get us to around there and it ended up giving us about 100, 108,000 titles. We were shooting for 70,000 because we still had to do journals and gov docs and, and that as well. And we also wanted a higher number because then we wanted to go through the process of having the subject librarians review it and, and campus as well. Uh, did we get pushback from librarians? Yes, <laughs> sometimes some we did. Here, kind of two of their main arguments about what they wanted to do, you know, sub li subject librarians are subject expertise, why can't they pick their own criteria uh, using even the green glass data. Valid point, uh, but just we used the campus task force had told us to avoid a title by title review and we also needed to uh, explain this whole process easily to get everyone on campus on board so that there wasn't people thinking the wrong thing and we thought if history uses this, we try to you know describe it, but it's different from what they use for engineering titles. It's just going to be incredibly uh, confusing to try to explain. Um, and then they also thought that this could weaken our uh, diversity um, of our collections, uh, which is uh, certainly a valid point. Basically, though, we always said this is the first step. We're starting with a higher number, and now it's your turn to use your expertise and to make sure you protect the things that you want. So quickly how that looked. Uh, we took the green glass information, we put it into Excel, everyone got their own charts based on their poll number assignments. This is a screenshot from Medicine. Uh, they had their numbers of how many were on there. We told them they could keep 5%. If anyone went over, we would probably have been okay with it. Actually, they didn't. Uh, and what was nice is um, my assistant in my department, who's much more Excel savvy, had a running total across the top. So every time they changed something from default to sh to move off site to keep here, it changed the number at the top, and it said, you know, you have one out of 237 on this list. So, so they just made it easy for them to go through it. And um, let's see, what did I get to? Oh, I'm sorry. So just basically, though, I would say that the engagement ranged from people who were engaged to apathetic to resigned to the whole process. What ended up happening is that 11 out of the 18 subject librarians selected titles to retain. I'm not sure why the other ones didn't. Uh, we did have some interim assignments that maybe they just didn't feel comfortable being involved at all, or they just honestly didn't really care or didn't have the time. But they um, elected to, to keep 2.9%, a little bit less than 3% of the collection. So that was fine. So then we had to move on to working with campus. And here is our different campus communication files. We had a website that we then kind of splashed across in the spotlight. Uh, we had you know, <coughs> mentioned it in newsletters. And we sent out emails uh, through different ways to try to make sure that people could be, uh, know about it. I mean, clearly we're, there's going to be someone on campus that's going to be like, I never heard what are you talking about when you took my books. But we, we tried our best. 
uh, the letter, which is very tiny and you can't see it, but it just says, you know, we are soliciting feedback from UCI faculty, staff, and students on lists of books and journals, blah, 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 blah. And, uh, you know, you may view the proposed titles here. Um, so this is very basically the um, web page that we created. Uh, what I want to show more is the actual how campus could be involved in this. Um, I took the screenshot after the project was finished. That's what says thank you for your participation. <laughs> uh, clearly, you know, when we started, it did not have that kind of information on there. But it gave a basic description of it. There was an FAQ. And when you clicked on Start Review, um, they actually had to log in. So we did know who they were. And then there were ways they could select a group. Uh, we ended up also having, I took the screenshot too early. Uh, East Asia was called out because it, it has its own area in our main library and we just didn't want the, their, those languages to be interspersed where they'd have to find them individually so there was finally another box um, you would go ahead and like in this example you'd hover over Langston library which is our main library and then you do it by call number and then once you clicked on d it would then break it down for you and you could get to da in this example great britain uh, and then the list of the titles would be there we had ways that you could just it was sorted by call number, but you could do a keyword search if you had a publisher or a series or something that you wanted. Um, and then all they had to do was check that box in the left-hand corner that says Keep on Campus. And as soon as they checked it, it actually removed it from the list. And it was, we, had, we put it into a Keep on Campus, so no, no, one, no one else ever had to see that title. It was done. Uh, okay, and that just sorry, explains that again, where it's just like, for your participation, you finished. So, uh, did we get faculty concerns? Yes, we did. <laughs> Not as many um, as some other places, so we were helpful about that. The initial ones were kind of housekeeping ones. That was okay. Uh, website was sluggish from off-campus. Some of our lists were kind of long. It took a little while to uh, load. We were able to fix that. It was a VPN issue um, for most of it. And um, initially, I think the a deadline had given them six weeks, and they were told us that that was like not nearly enough. But we did have to turn in a final report to the provost in January, so we extended it um, another month. But that was pretty much you know, where we had to cut it off. That they did have December to do it. Um, besides that, to get more into the nitty gritty, yes, we had a couple of French historians, a music faculty and a computer scientist who did send us some complaints. And here's a snippet of one from the French library, French historian. Uh, my background is I was a history librarian fan before, so I totally get it about um, you know, wanting to keep stuff there to browse. Um, basically, you know, this is just saying, even with this clear communication and close collaboration we can, faculty are going to object. So some of the principles underlying the, uh, the move are we responded promptly. We made sure uh, everything was funneled through one person, um, but we discussed it before response. We corrected any misapprehensions that there might have been. We assured them that we had this process that they could retain as many titles as they wanted. Um, we'll get to that in a sec. And, um, you know, we explained we had stats can be useful. We currently are off-site storage uh, makes up has 12% of our collection, which is smaller than a lot of the other ARLs. We like to throw that around. Um, they're not going to love it because of the, their, their um, disciplines, but we, we do have a virtual browse that exists that includes our off-site storage, so and that's this person's complaint that you can't serendipitously find things. We did offer to meet in person to discuss this more, and none of them took us up on that offer. Mm -hmm. They're busy, so really in the end there was no major protest, so it seems that people have accepted it. Here is the final numbers for what the faculty uh, selected to keep in that line. It wasn't actually that very many. Um, and then what was nice is that I weekly got an email saying what had been selected. Um, so it was a running tally and the, their, their name or their ID names of who it was. Um, we did have someone, I mean this was earlier on, that went up to 800, one of our French historians, but it was okay, we still had the room to be able to, to allow that. So it, no one went super crazy, I guess. Uh, did we have some complications? Yes, we did. Tried to figure out, uh, we, we talked about it, but the journal holdings data, uh, to set what we could send off to our offsite storage was very difficult in the UC system. Our offsite storages are located at UCLA and Berkeley, and when we go in to look at journal holdings and volumes, um, it's in one cell. The, the Like saying, you know, Berkeley has one cell and it will have every journal holding. 
and buried in that is the offsite storage. So it's hard to tell if it's at the Berkeley Library, if it's at the offsite storage, and if we can send it. We didn't want to. We decided really on, we're like, oh, we just can't deal with this. We don't want to send journals. But um, it, politically, from a top, they're like, no, that makes the most sense as a science library. We've got to get rid of our journals that have electronic access, that are little used. So it, did, it was a time-consuming process of trying to figure out what was there and what wasn't. We did this in the midst of an LSP migration. So our green glass data um, included links to our OPAC that no longer existed. That's, you know, you got to do it when you're, when you're told to do the project. Um, sending things to our offsite storage, because it is a shared facility, we had to get permission, we had to wait, and I had to go back and forth. So there were some conversations about that. And we're still in the process of, of doing the shifting and moving things. So we are not 100% sure we have actually cleared out everything that we need to. We will. Hope to find out soon, but I don't know if we don't, what it will mean and how we will be going forward. So just to wrap it up, um, some of the things that we learned. Um, what I was saying was like be firm about internal decisions, as I, we kind of flip-flop partially ways, and as my boss said, it's like we're, 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 I'm an admiral and I have to shift the entire fleet from thinking we weren't going to include journals to including journals, and then also the whole adding the main library in um, as a sign. So it would have been nice if we had figured that out when we started the project, if we had a good project management plan in place. Um, obviously, communication and consultation is key. Uh, this is different because it says be flexible, whereas before it says be firm. But I, what I meant was be flexible uh, with the campus constituents when you can. We had, we had a firm deadline of the end of December, but one faculty member um, said I was on sabbatical. I just didn't even know this project existed. I really want to be involved. So we turned it on for him, and then we had a one, another professor in East Asia who had had eye surgery, it was eye strain, and they couldn't see the Excel spreadsheet, so, you know, it wasn't on, I mean, the, the link was still active that we gave it to the two extra people. Those are things that, you know, it's going to make them happy, but we can go ahead and absorb that. You probably know it, but we forgot that Excel sometimes sorts things weird. <laughs> so, you know, we had one uh, computer scientist go through, I can't, you know, I don't, QA176 and thought, he had reviewed everything, but then we found out later in the list that you know, 176 also was in the thousands or whatever. So we had to go back and uh, redo some of the lists and just make sure that those were uh, fixed up. And of course, we did all this work still not knowing if we were going to get approval for it. So uh, we did have to wait uh, three months for the provost to decide, and he did say yes. Decisions still need to be, I mean, obviously lots of decisions have to be made about the whole shifting parts now, but things that happened um, are UC the system bought the Cambridge Journal back file after the review. Can we now include those journals even though they weren't on the list for the faculty to review? Our law library separate entity said, hey, oh, you're going to get all those books? <laughs> Can we have them instead? And, you know, so we had to make some decisions about that. Um, when we are looking at these things, obviously there's been some missing titles and other stuff that we've had to contend with. So um, I'm not quite sure what time we have. A minute left here, <laughs> but uh, if you have any questions, uh, I think you did for um, Ying or myself. We are happy to answer them and happy to stay later. I know some of you guys might have to. Skip out. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the um, the UI for um, uh, for the, the the pick list that you sent out to faculty and to the subject librarians yeah. that developed in house or yes. Oh, okay. Our our library IT team did it. Oh, wow. Yes, I know nothing about it, but if you ever need to know, I can certainly put you in the yeah, that'd be great. person <laughs> that, that developed it for us. So did you actually read the Uh We well, we're still in the process, but um, there was sorry, yes, there was some reading of um, journals that we had a lot online, and. Um, while we were doing this, the UC system uh, had a federal document archive project going on that was just great because they're like, here's a list of 55,000 government documents that we have. We have a preservation print copy and are either digitized and hard to trust or are being digitized. So you can get rid of them if you want. You don't even have to offer them up. Just get rid of them. So we took them up on that offer. I think we had about 20,000. Yeah, I know. It was great. <laughs> we did not know that was going to be happening. Do you guys have, uh, so it sounds like maybe not, but um, this was all dealing with the storage in your libraries, but do you have storage issues with your offsite storage? Like, are you running out of space there, or is that a concern? 
Because uh, I come yes. to the University of Georgia <laughs> and we have no space. Okay, so. And we can't get new yes. space built. Oh, see, that's. Mm -hmm. we are, I guess we should be lucky in that. We, we definitely have a problem with our. It's called the Southern Regional Library Facility for the Southern UC campuses. It is projected to run out in the next couple of years, and um, UCLA campus cannot build onto it. Um, they border Brentwood, which is a very fancy neighborhood that's a no, and there's also apparently an earthquake fault line somewhere. So um, we did get permission to add on to the Northern Library facility, which is in Oakland, which I'm not familiar with. It's on the northern side of Cam uh, California, and we're on the south. And the plan is that we will all share that space going how much, forward. And how much space will that be? I'm sorry, that? I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, I, I think it's it's substantial. Uh, it's just it is going to be a change in our thinking about how fast turnaround time is. Sure. Um, uh, but we did get permission, and I think they technically did break ground, but it might be a little while. Yeah. Did you have to pay for your offsite storage? Um, yes. So we normally d we get an a yearly allocation uh, that we do not have to pay for, mm -hmm. but because this is considered an exceptional deposit and it went, you know, normally our allocation is like ten thousand volumes and we yes, asked for seventy two thousand. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's something like three dollars a book, but this again, campus is footing the bill. I mean, and, and we had to pay, but not the library. And our um, is that an annual fee? No. That okay, was a one so it was a one time. So yes. you got one time financial support for this project. Yes, I okay. guess. I was, um, besides the renovation, and they pay for green glass, and they've got some. Oh, no! I you know what. I have to take that. I think we actually were able to get a new FTE that is permanent because we now have additional tenants in the building as well that we are going to have to manage. You know, they're going to be coming to us for janitorial services for repair. I guess so. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, just about. In either of your cases, did you guys take physical condition into? account when you were choosing your read? We did. Uh -huh. Before we start the project, the access services, the stacks maintenance team looks through sure. the shelves and pull all the damaged books mm -hmm. first. So we delete those first before we run the report. Okay. We did not, and we have run into where they've been pulling some of the books and they are damaged, and we have been making Okay, some of them we have been repairing, others that are too far damaged, we, we aren't waiting those, I guess I should say, yeah. So technically we did need some books. But Do you know what percentage? Oh, it would, I don't, because they're still in the process, but I would say it is minimal. Okay. Um, like sing, single digit? Yes. Yeah. 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 So what we run into, I'm at the University of Nebraska, <coughs> Lincoln, so our liaisons work from spreadsheets, but what they're found once we started doing the shifting, there's a lot of things that are not on the, the yeah. spreadsheets. Uh -huh. And so how did you go about um, making those decisions? Did you, I mean, <coughs> one or two things did you do? Since they haven't been discoverable, mm -hmm. they haven't been checked out, did you make uh, immediate decisions or did you have liaisons come back through and make a decision? Yeah, we, we ran the same problem. We ran into the same problem. We didn't do right away. We wait for next round. Mm -hmm. Because this is our first weekend project. Uh, so uh, after five years, another round will start all the work in, and we'll check into those later. So then you put, then you had to, so you chose to keep those, so you have them on another spreadsheet so that you can make a decision <laughs> you're saying, I, I thought you were asking, it's like we, we had a little list and they weren't available to pull, but you're saying that there were titles that were Even on a shelf, shelf that were not in our catalog? Right. That, okay, so you're asking, yeah. Um, we did, yes, that happened, I don't, I, I haven't heard specifically for this project, but that, that's been uh, a problem, because I don't think they're looking, I mean, they're, it's student show, you know, right. workers right. that are just right. going right. from a list and crossing yeah. things yeah. off. But that we certainly run into that where we find things that don't have barcodes or what, not separately. Yeah. After the project, we check the shelves and we see some books shouldn't be there mm -hmm. and why they are still there. And then we check <coughs> this book against our spreadsheet and those books are not on our spreadsheet. That's right. why it didn't get weighted. So once we run that, into that issue, we just uh, wait. We cannot go back again to do all the work again mm -hmm. for that project for for that specific collection. We just wait for next time. 
for, for us, and I thought the initial question, we've actually been surprised at how many books are on the shelf that are on our list. Again, as a previous history librarian, and I've done some smaller reading projects, at least in history, I thought it was a significant portion of the titles were not on the shelves. Because they were checked out? or uh, No, but you know, they were not missing or reading yeah. shelf. Or self -weeded. Yeah, self-weeded. Don't bring it back. <laughs> Uh, and so we were, because we, we're actually higher, our weeding list is higher than what our offsite storage will take. And I said, it's not going to be a problem. There's going to be some, you know, like 15% of the books aren't going to be there. And, and um, I misspoke. I was thinking of mostly from, like, as the humanities, and it has not been the case so far. So they're actually being a little bit more selective of how the order that they're pulling the books to move offsite to make sure we start with the really high impacted areas first, because we might not be able to actually send oh, it. Sure. 